Welcome to The Course, a community that brings creativity to academic discourse and teaching experiences. I'm Brittany Fentice. And I'm Rashina Fountain. With this project, we want to rethink the student-teacher feedback loop by empowering artistry as a response to texts across a variety of genres in the classroom. Our goal is to show how creativity contributes to scholarship and offers insights to cultural critique. In this episode, we talk with Bobby Kindred and Kelly Kleeman, two poetic graduate students at the University of Washington. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you for like gathering with us today for the course. We can start our rehearsal, course rehearsal now. Rehearsal? <laughs> or something like that, or it's the big debut. I really enjoy being called the course because it is kind of like that. It does feel like we're just in conversation with um, things that really resonate with us and we're just having casual conversations about it. It's like just a talk circle. It's a lot of fun. So thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I love how you're calling it casual. Is does it not feel casual? Does it feel like because I mean we are about to read this academic text. You know, yes. so, this, this is the most the most like academic we got. Yeah. So this should be an experiment to see mm-hmm. how like we could stay on brand. <laughs> Right, like it's, it'll be kind of fun to see how we could um, like disrupt the grad student, like what is that, like conference circle, like what is, what's the classes that we have? Like, like a seminar. seminar. Yeah, because it's, it feels like it might be a seminar, our conversation, but like hopefully it could be fun, because mm-hmm. sometimes it ain't fun. Uh-uh. Yeah, so let us know about yourselves. Okay, I'll start. Uh, hey, my name is Bobby Kindred, they, he pronouns, third year PhD student in the Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies Department. Um, my research as it stands is looking at Black feminist interventions into 12-step recovery programs, uh, specifically the conditions that produce a desire uh, for Black people to exist otherwise within these programs. So creating our own um, separate spaces, but still utilizing the 12 step as an infrastructure. Um, but I'm making the argument that despite some of the infrastructural faults in um, Alcoholics Anonymous, which is typically um, a lot of the narratives that we hear center the experiences of white people, um, as well as like colorblind um, politics and a bunch of stuff, um, that it's still a site of um, Black feminist praxis. And so my research is basically outlining how that is, what makes what we do specifically Black people do in Alcoholics Anonymous Afrocentric, um, and what are some of the principles in 12-step recovery that speaks to the Afrocentric paradigm that is helpful for recovering Black people. So that's more so what I'm interested in research-wise. Creatively, um, I am uh, re-entering a my being a visual artist after spending most of my life since high school um, being a spoken word poet um, finding that I have less words to say and that I need an alternative expression of the kinds of things I've been thinking through so visual art seems to be the di- direction towards that and my visual art is still speaking to my academic interest um, of these otherwise worlds specifically the kinds of worlds that that can be created through folklore and um, yeah, just, um, yeah, just exploring like um, folklore rooted in uh, black people um, taking flight to escape um, some of the egregious conditions of uh, not only chattel enslavement, but police violence and just all kinds of anti-black violence, but like mostly through, yeah, of, 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 of flying African narratives. So that is a small part of who I am and what <laughs> the work I'm doing. Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, and thank you, Bobby, for sharing. Um, so I'm Kelly, 
I use uh, she, they pronouns, and I'm a first year uh, PhD student in the English department on the literature and culture track. Um, my research interests are involved with Black and Indigenous literatures, and particularly speculative fiction, uh, depictions of the future, and like kind of how that relates to broader themes, including decolonization and like relationship with the environment. Um, so that all of those elements kind of helped in my like reading of of McKittrick, um, but we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Um, and creatively, I'm more used to doing kind of academic student work. So that was something that was really intriguing for me to, to work on. Um, and I typically do either um, kind of written, I guess, creative work. So like uh, short stories or poems or just kind of flowy writing, I guess, um, or I like to do um, kind of video editing or kind of, yeah, video related uh, creative work. Um, but yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's me. Uh, and thank you for having me here. Um, I guess I'll quickly share, y'all know me. Um, I'm Brittany. And I feel like I've said like um, what we do here, like both me and Rashina <laughs> every single time. So it's like, but just so that you all know um, and what I'll be bringing to like the table um, in this conversation, I also look at um, Black feminist work. Um, I'm mostly in like queer studies and Black feminism and Black, Black studies in general, I'm really interested in. And um, I also look towards speculative fiction to think about like how are contemporary Black arts and literature really building this other world that like, um, how this other world, this Black world already exists and has always existed and how we need new reading methods to understand what this Black world is. And um, creatively, I like to dabble in all different things. As you can see here, I do like a lot of printmaking and linoleum carvings. That's a lot of fun. And um, I also do like some painting and things like that. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you for sharing everyone. Um, and always great to hear more about your work, even though I feel like I know you all, but then like hearing you talk about your work is awesome. Um, so I, um, I am a first year PhD student um, in the English literature and culture track. Um, and um, I, I feel like my work or my interest as a scholar is um, finding itself. <laughs> um, and so I came in, I would say, um, you know, having done my MFA, um, looking at Black land relationships. Um, and particularly my, my memoir was looking at um, my family's relationship with um, the land and my family's um, displacement and um, some of the alternative geographies, right? Like uh, within my family. And so uh, I'm, I would say I'm interested in um, the idea of like migration, um, more and more and uh, what it means to return and what it means to reconnect and what it re means to remember. Um, and so um, specifically I'm working on, um, uh, yeah, so like what does it mean to have, um, to return? And like, I, I would say like that, that is like where I'm, I'm starting um, and, um, what does it mean to um, uh, imagine within those returning and like, yeah. So, so something I'm working on is looking at reverse migrations and how people um, return to like, a, you know, you want to return to the land or return to the home of your ancestors. But um, like in thinking about that returning as a, a way to reimagine instead of returning to something in the past um, is something that I'm uh, looking at and it's related to the article today, so I'll stop there. Um, but uh, so yeah, I'm interested in black uh, relationships with land, um, uh, environmental humanities, 
uh, Black geographies. Um, and creatively, uh, I'm working on a lot of poetry right now. Um, I feel like that's something I have gotten away from, but that is just feels called for me to um, work on more and more um, these days. I'm like really excited for this conversation. I feel like so much of how we've talked about our interests, this like imagining team, this imagining decolonization, anti-colonization and um, world building even is so integral to like what we have just read. And so I'm excited to hear like what we have talked about um, or what I'm excited to hear what you all thought about um, McKittrick's work. I just thought it'd be interesting to do a um, academic work. As you were saying before, Rashina, this is the most academic we've ever gone. We've done like art shows and like films and things like that. Um, and so I was like, maybe I think it'd be fun to just like do um, either a monograph or an essay or something like that and have a conversation about it. And Rashina, you were really, well, I think, didn't I ask you about McKittrick's work and you were really cool to um, this article that you read? Yeah, so this one and then Dear Science uh, mm -hmm. is another one that mm -hmm. I'm working through. Um, yeah, and I think I was reading it at the time uh, in uh, Black Geographies, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, and I think it's doing a great job of like helping us or like allowing us to think about what does it mean to be like in this like almost in between, I don't know, I'm kind of getting into the essay now, like something that I really took away from it, like this in between of like really reckoning with like persistent anti-Black violence and like the legacies of like slavery and how like how modernity like gave birth to like certain logics, anti-Black logics and how we can still see those in our present, but also wanting to think about like, well, what is another narrative outside of Black suffering that can still give us a sense of like Blackness that is still Black. And so it doesn't forsake any of those two categories, which I think is like often happening in a lot of like Black studies discourse, where it's either like, be really focused on black suffering or like don't think about black suffering, think about black joy. And like, um, they're just so like, uh, what's that word? Desperate, they're, they're like wide apart. And so I think this article really helps us think about like how are these two things like happening simultaneously? Now that's one of my takeaways. Yeah, um, and listening to you speak makes me think about a lot of my own research too. So I became interested in looking at like Black feminist resistance specifically in Alcoholics Anonymous because everything that I was reading was basically always situating Black people in a space of wounship. Every article that I read was like, this is not a place for us. And so I was interested in like, well, I'm in it and I see that this is a space in which black people are thriving because we make it so, so sort of like, I was interested in betraying this archive that was already created for 12 step recovery, but also specifically about the experiences of black people. And I really love this quote in McKittrick's piece where, um, she states that the conditions of bondage did not foreclose Black geographies, but rather incited alternative mapping practices during and after transatlantic slavery, many of which were produced outside of the official tenets of cartography, fugitive and maroon maps, literacy maps, food nourishment maps, family maps, music maps were assembled alongside real maps, those produced by Black cartographers and explorers who document land masses, roads, routes, boundaries, and so forth. And I think that that is really important to me because um, in thinking about like this archive that has yet to exist about Black people's experience in 12 step recovery, there's so many alternative ways that we do archive our practices or exist um, it, that may not be documented and so um i think i was just interested in like these um alternative forms of like mapping or rereading what's already there that that highlights black livingness and not this inevitability of like black death or this inevitability inevitability of black suffering as like the like 
we have always like it's what we've always done we've always carved out these spaces for ourselves in the midst of these infrastructures that like aim to kill us we're still here and so there's tools and practices that we've cultivated that keeps us here thank you for sharing that quote because that's one that i wrote down in like um really was important for me and also like kind of thinking about my work and when i read that quote one thing i was thinking about if i take it to um the plantation not less symbolically but like thinking about harriet tubman um and some some of the alternative mapping that i learned about harriet tubman right so you know we can see um her story as someone who freed slaves or it's like running away from this violence or you can see this person who uh, learned the waterways, who was mm -hmm. able to communicate owl sounds to um, signal freedom, um, who um, studied botany. And so like, you know, so looking at that and like not only, yeah, seeing that story and less of one of reactionary, like running away, but like, you know, the type of geography um pract geographical practices and connections with land and co-collaborations with uh animals <laughs> things you know um i find it extremely empowering and so yeah that that quote um really spoke to me as well and kind of encapsulates uh this article a lot for me i wanted to like think about the idea of place placelessness uh because that's something that comes up a couple of times in um in the in the piece and at first i kind of wasn't sure how to think of it but now based on what rashina was explaining about like seeing harriet tubman as someone who is like co-collaborating in in the environment that she's in to do all of these things that she's doing it's like um because i'm trying to find the specific quote i think it's on 954 but it's like uh it starts blackness is recognizably placeless um and degraded and therefore justifiably without um and then it goes forward but i think thinking about blackness as displacement but also as i guess the ability to adapt to and incorporate the place you're in so for harriet tubman that would be like the north north america but it's like blackness is not defined to necessarily one specific place it's like almost omnipresent it's like it's everywhere so i think when mckittrick is talking about blackness is blackness is placeless it's like you could um read it as in one way as being displaced or without a solid maybe sense of place or you could see it as like like you are you are the place that you are it doesn't mean that you aren't, you know, like, I'm trying to think how to express it. Um, but just being able to, I guess, maybe adapt to become the place that you are. And mm -hmm. that's where the like, kind of the co collaboration element with the environment that you're existing in, and develop like, developing the relationship with the land that you are in. And it doesn't have to be a sense of like, like ownership. Kelly, it was really resonating when I was listening to you, this paradox that uh, McKittrick is bringing up, this idea of like, uh, like in white logic, white supremacist logic, we can understand blackness as, as without, because of like how, you know, the white imagination has made a life where blackness is without. Um, but there's also life like just because like the white imagination cannot see black life doesn't necessarily mean that black life does not exist and so it's just these alternate like we need alternative ways of looking at black life existing in order to um like fully understand this paradox um i think there was a line where she's talking about um where she's bringing up the paradox of being displaced by land, but also being integral to land as well. And, um, and also think about it like, I don't think that she was just thinking in terms of land per se, but was also thinking in terms of 
like being dispossessed by this capitalist system, but also black labor is the one that is like fueling um, this capital. Well, I wouldn't say fueling, but it's black labor is so integral to this cap the same system that is forsaking black life. And so it's, it's that kind of paradox that like, it doesn't make sense, but we live in a world in which it's being made to make sense. Um, do y'all feel what I'm saying? Like, is it like, yeah, this idea of that you like white imagination doesn't want black life, but needs black life in order to keep the white imagination going, like this, the white imagined conditions going. Um, I think that's the paradox that she's pulling up that I thought was really interesting. Well, I was thinking about that too a lot. I really liked that quote. It's on 950, if anyone has that open. Um, but it, wh what I really liked about it was the concept of being with, which is exactly, I think, what you're talking about, Brittany. And uh, as McKittrick describes the paradox where you, like, Blackness is... Uh, required along with the exploitation of land, uh, the genocide of indigenous people, the exploitation of black labor, those are like the kind of tenets of this system. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the like concept of uh, freedom or emancipation that has been kind of delivered, I think historically is that the desire is for black people to exist within that system which can't it's like that is that's the, the paradox is that that's the desire to exist within the system that requires the exploitation of your labor like inherently that is a founding tenant of the system um and so that's something that i really was like sitting with and thinking about that she encapsulated so beautifully in just one sentence um and I think I wrote down another element of the, okay, and so I think this is further down on the page, but there's also the um, line, this paradigmatic perspective on race and blackness in its denial of an entangled racial history, and then there's a bit cut out, but uh, normalizing the practice of colonization as it naturalizes overdevelopment, accumulation, and land ownership as identifiable, seeable locales of emancipation. So it's like, in order to be free under this system, you have to participate in the, uh, in the goals of, of the system by entangling with it and like land ownership is, is a main tenet of being seen as free um but that's a colonial relationship to the land it's not a co-collaborative it's exploitative and so it's like playing into the system that is doing the same thing to the land that the system is doing to black people and black bodies and black labor and the oh my gosh just the, like, sitting and thinking about that was just so like because it's explained so clearly but it's so kind of i think um you don't always put the words to it but it's kind of constantly in, in your mind i wonder if anybody's open to like think about archiving um and i really am resonating with the quote that you brought up bobby um early on like these alternative ways of carto cartography of mapping of like locating oneself um that made me think about archiving a lot and how um alongside understanding different modes of mapping do we also need to understand different modes of archiving as well and like how do we how do we like look to the past to understand these different ways of black life and black mapping um like what are the ways because like i think we can also look at sadia hartman's work and see how like the archive is a problem too and even i think mckedrick brings it up here often like the archive we can't necessarily readily go to that to understand these alternative mappings. So do we also, do you believe that we also need like a different archiving method as well? Or is there anything about this article that makes us think archiving is necessary? This quote that I really love about um, 
about archival work, but colonized archival work. It was okay. It was talking about something on the lines of the written word versus versus the spoken word, um, and how the written the written word is privileged because it's seeable, it's observable, it's text, but it lacks feeling, it it lacks emotion, things that aren't valued that aren't valued in a European worldview. Um, or European way of seeing things. Um, and I read this book by DT Niani called Sundiata, but it's an epic of, of Old Mali. Um, and it's basically retelling the story of a griot. And a griot is a, a person who speaks the history of the people um, and the histories that the griot speaks is documented over time, but it's all like the documentation of this oral narrative as it was shared. They have a person who is literally documenting alongside them throughout their lifetime and they're documenting the experiences of their people. But I'm really interested in like, yeah, just like archival methods through oral narrative telling, um, because one, it like, comes from the people that were there during that time. I'm not connecting this to the article. I'm just thinking about archiving and like my own practice, how I wanna go about my own ethnographic work, um, researching people uh, within recovery. And yeah, there's something about this practice of like, um, yeah, just like emotion or like feeling behind our world, uh, behind our words and just like our embodiment being so policed and regulated and um, devalued. And, um, and when I'm thinking about like police too, it's like even like tones of rage being, being policed and how rage can signify, anger and rage can signify, um, you know, um, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, just how like, rage can point to, in a tone can point to, regardless of what's being said, conditions that may not be seen in a scene. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's so much to be captured just through the spoken word. Um, and yeah, that's an archival practice that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, I think I think about music a lot in terms of mapping. Um, again, one of the ways that I've been um, trying to look towards like black land relationships is through blues, blues music. Um, and um, I think that allows, like for instance, uh, my, my great uncle um, was a sharecropper, um, lived in a sharecropper shack, but it was, it was a juke joint, you know? And so like, instead of it being a sharecropper shack, it's a juke joint and it's a like place of blues. And so, um, you know, again, that idea of like returning, um, not returning to go see some sharecropper or it's like shack or see the fields that my my ancestors work but you know what are the what are the stories that they created there like what what are yeah what are some of those alternative geographies like um like blues music that can um does a lot more <laughs> than highlight the pain that they they endured um and so yeah i think blues is like that sweet spot kind of I would say that like blues is very um you know in tune with what McKittrick is saying because blues is a mood right and it's kind of like that depressive mood but it's also um a call and response and there's some joy there's some relief um when you when you um you know improvise and so there's improvisation of you know that that depressive mood um, and a reimagining and a questioning. So yeah, I would say, um, yeah, music is, is, is a way that I look to, to map. So um, this part of sharing our creative responses is um, 
it's geared towards modeling, like what other people and what other students can do if they were to creatively respond to um, a piece. So like, you know how often in our, you know, classes, maybe the ones that we're teaching or studying, we often like think whoever gives us a work and we have to like write out a response to it. And so now we're thinking about like, what if we didn't have to write it out? What if we can, um, I guess, be multimodal about it, just be creative about it. Um, what are some ways that we can still um, use McKittrick work as like a citation to our own work? How can it influence our ideas? Um, I don't know, Rasheen, do you wanna add anything to this portion? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you did a good, great job introducing it. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to like verbatim, like repeat back any, McKittrick, but yeah, like what what could be inspired by um, some even some of the things that we talked to talk to each other um, about um, and that students could potentially showcase or um, not showcase. I feel like that's like like that students could demonstrate their engagement with the piece, but not in a like regurgitative construct constructive um, write your essay <laughs> type of way. I'm happy to, to start us off. Um, this is not typically how I create at all, but I just, um, I was just writing about, so I'm interested in the loophole of retreat, which is comes from Harriet Jacobs novel, um, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Um, and a lot of the ways people theorize around the loophole of retreat is that it's this interstitial space, which it is a space that if it's like it can be a physical space within a building but like think of an attic uh an, an attic not an attic think of an attic um right like so the casual observer the casual observer may not know that this place exists but if its intended use is per has been purposeful for you like like you know of the space because it was made for you to know of it and if it wasn't made for you to know of it then you wouldn't know it exists otherwise um and so I've been thinking about this loophole space, um, which is this in-between space for, for Harriet Jacobs, um, hiding out in this, um, in this space on the plantation um, that she was undetectable to her slave master. Um, and yet this was a space of self-definition and freedom that she was able to carve out for herself um, before she eventually escaped slavery seven years later after hiding out in this space. But I think about that for unofficial, I'll read my piece and then I can explain my thinking behind it. Um, this is called A Loophole of Resistance, A World Otherwise in the Home of Sisters in Sobriety. It's not a poem, it's just kind of prose thoughts, okay. If you came here without purpose, suppose you made a wrong turn to meet a dead end, you never know us otherwise. If you approach the succulent stained porch from weather pots and perched your ears to the entry door, you finally hear the laughter belly born. We meet here and what reads is just another North Oakland block where the black babies run the concrete worn, buzzing of syncopated hymns and songs of youth rendered the possibility of such existence. When the meeting commences, unofficial, ours, otherwise. We light sage to cleanse the living room space of S's home in which we've all been invited to convene. The Sisters in Sobriety, regular Tuesday night meeting at the interstices of out there unrecovered and not quite AA approved, for we know outside issues fester on the inside and cannot be relegated to the unspoken. We take three minutes and then unapologetically speak over time for we un-Judeo Christian time. We crosstalk, gumbo ya ya, snapping, grunting, affirming, ooh yesing, and me tooing, otherwise. We create kinship, exclusively black and brown. We know our recovery relies on this. A consciousness raising circle and all sober, all siblings. And if you have not come up, and if you had not come over here with purpose, you'd never know us. If you've seen us at an official meeting, perhaps mixed meetings where white folk gatekeep gatekeep any utterance of race an issue of the outside they say you may as missed you may have mistook us for fellows among fellows 
not ever knowing we were scouting out our own, not ever knowing the kind of desperations that led us to such place, not ever knowing we were, we were maroons, not ever knowing we were hidden right in front of your face. So when I wrote this, I was thinking about how there's official AA meetings in which are typically mixed white people, black people, but they're things you can't talk about. You can't talk about race, gender, sexuality. Those are all considered outside issues. You're supposed to just keep your share on alcoholism. But for black people, we know that like all of these systems and these structures impact our sobriety. So we created these unofficial meetings that were not common i mean we're meeting in somebody's living room where you know in official meetings you speak three minutes and when your time is up your time is up you're not supposed to comment on someone else's share um but in this space like we're cross talking we're speaking over time we're talking about race gender and sexuality and how all these systems impact our sobriety um and it's because we're in this sort of in-between space this interest this um you know, we're not quite official AA members because we're breaking all the rules, but we're not quite out there in the world unrecovered and not doing sobriety. And we're able to, um, yeah, self self define, practice self definition um, within a program that's designed to keep us in captivity through withholding the truths of our narratives. Um, so, yeah. That's that's what I wrote. Um, oh, I can definitely see how like how you are like in the poem. It seems like there is like a decentering of like those a meetings that are so um, that don't want like outside um, outside issues. Like there's not. I appreciate how it doesn't seem that in in your work those centers are are centered rather what seems centered is like the family that you um that the narrative is speaking of like it, what's centered is like the conversations that are being had there and um but i also appreciate much like how i appreciate mckittrick's work that it's, it's not like there's a forgetting of the violence of these other systems or these other um meetings like there's there's still violence there and you still like call attention to it, but you're also spending a lot more time thinking about the family that is being or the kinship that is being um, cultivated in these other spaces. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate it that if I'm understanding your poem. You totally working. are. And there's this additional piece about recruitment because we do go to these mixed meetings with white people, but we're recruiting our own. And on a face level, right, they just think we're alcoholics among alcoholics, fellows amongst fellows, right, in these mixed spaces, but they don't know that, like, we're recruiting the one other Black person you see to come join this, this underground space, this, this recovery underground, um, which is like, yeah, which is also a part of it. Like, we'll be a part of the larger infrastructure, but we underneath it is our own self-defining practices that is going to be unbeknownst to anybody who's not invited into what we're doing. Yeah, I found that that piece really strong, like the the um, the yearning, like what could be interpreted as like maybe silence or there's like this communication happening that uh, and yeah, and creating that um, that map for people who will have that yearning. Um, that that piece, like that part, really stood out to me. Um, yeah, just like the uh, I don't want to say like call and response, but yeah, there's like this like this yearning and then um, being there to answer and then yeah, that being kind of si that's silent, like that's not yeah. Yeah, I also wanted to say thank you, Bobby, for sharing your piece because I like Rashina found it incredibly strong um and I think there it did feel kind of uh like a call and response in the in this especially when you were talking about like we don't have these rules we talk over each other we snap and we do like and oh yes and all of these things like it's not this place of rigidity where there are 
rules around the way you speak and and the way you kind of interact amongst each other um and you are you know the call and response feel maybe comes as you're describing kind of the the nature of being in of being in that space but i also thank you so much for sharing your work it was very very powerful to hear thanks for engaging thanks for seeing me y'all see what i'm doing so mine is i guess more of a poem but um it's i can i'll, I'll share and then i can kind of explain i think because there is i'm pulling from a lot of different places so it may or may not make sense but okay so <clears throat> so um i didn't i didn't have a title for it but uh california condors feed on carrion dead things uh they fly off the coasts soaring spread wings over the ocean to the drifting carcass of a whale water lapping against the talons tearing at the feed thundering waves pull in and you paddle out to meet them they call you in and remember the first condor and the cliffs people and your first stumbled steps being so delighted babbling from the shore and when you didn't come back the years they sent the salt air as far inland as possible desperate to reach you and return you and to bring you home okay so that was my <laughs> that was my poem um and i think i was really pulling from um mckittrick's piece i was thinking about the section um and i wrote it down so let me just check back on that before i before i just forget what i was talking about um but the section that uh, talks about being with as uh existence under a system that requires the exploitation of land and the kind of emphasis on displacement of black people so i was trying to think of it not as in an ign ignorance of the complications between the relationship between black people in place but like kind of more of the relationship to land that black people experience so this was also so one of the many things I, I drew on just in writing this was um, some work that I did as an undergrad um, with a program at UCSD called uh, Black Surf Week, and that was a uh, recurring event um, that took place over the course of a week um, before the beginning of the fall quarter where Black students, uh, undergrad students, graduate students, and faculty were invited to uh, take lessons and learn how to surf and then also have these conversations um, about blackness and relationship to land and place and like space and just being and so that kind of um, inspired inspired a little bit of the poem and just kind of connection to water and um, and like water is having memory and like kind of calling on even if the world and the system you're existing in is kind of uh emphasizing your displacement or like non-belonging uh that that is not the the system that controls the water and the memory of the land that does remember you and does you know has that sense of, of knowing like tangible kind of knowing that you are in your in your place like you do belong so that was kind of the main thing and then just also um randomly like an interest in california condors and listening to a podcast um that is, does an interview with a condorologist i don't know if there's a, another word for that but um yeah um a black condor condorologist named jonathan hall who does work with like uh condors that are i think growing out of being an extinct species and their relationship to non uh white or non colonial like pre uh colonization and like a decolonization kind of understanding of geography so that was also something that i thought was interesting to kind of at least touch on in relationship to mckittrick but 
yeah okay so that's my that's my thing thank you everyone for listening um your work reminded me a lot of alexis pauline gums and um i didn't know what a i didn't know what the conduit i was just thinking orcas <laughs> i was thinking orcas and i was thinking like this relationship between black people in the water and our ancestry also being located in the water and how the things that happen to our relatives in the in the ocean mimics life um here and we have this understanding of one of one another specifically i was thinking about the story of that um of the orca whose um mother their the baby somehow died i think it was pollution that caused the orca's um baby to die but this mother dragged the baby in the water for 17 days this dead her dead calf in the water for 17 days and it's been theorized that it was done to to show the world like this is what happened to my baby look at what you did um and how that mimics you know um emmett till's mother keeping the casket open so so that we could see you know what 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 the what white supremacy did um to you know Emmett Till. And so I was just in your poem, I was just thinking about this, this deep interconnection between black people in the water, in the land, and how it is so part of our like, um, I think the word is epistemology, one of those ology words where we understand that there is this deep interconnection, that it's not separate. Um, and besides that, your writing is just really beautiful. Can I just name that well thinking about like safe havens and um, that's something i've been thinking about a lot and uh the description of the water as being that that um and just the water having memory and the water having agency was really um i appreciated that and also um there's a part of the mckittrick article that i thought about um i forget it slipped but i had it two seconds ago but it made me think about what we were talking about earlier. Um, oh, about ownership, right? You said in, like with, oh, you, you probably mentioned that already, but yeah, just like how there's this um, relationality and not this like extractive like relationship. Um, and so that stood out to me. Yeah, relationality stood out to me too. Like when you were talking about how like the, the water remembers and the water remembers, you know, the um, the you as the narrator. I, I thought it was interesting. I'm always interested when writers use you or second person um, narration. I'm always fascinated by that. And I love the idea that the water remembers you. Um, and so it's almost like as we're reading it, as we're listening to it, we're getting placed into the narrative. Um, like, well, second person always has that um, effect on me. I feel like I'm in the story. I'm like a part of the story. And so then, um, yeah, that also made me think about alternative relationality now. Like, how can we find ourselves in relation to the land and to the waters and um, to the beings of like the lands and waters? Yeah, so it made me think about relationality a lot. So I'm going to share my screen because I think structure matters. Um, in thinking about uh, this this poem, um, so in in writing this poem, or um, just in general, um, I, that's something I'm reckoning with in terms of like uh, violence and um, finding the alternative geographies within violence. And so, specifically related to my my hometown, Chicago, um, and I think that a lot of times the the narrative of my city is um rooted in you know a lot of people are like oh you're from chicago oh i heard it's dangerous <laughs> you know or um you know it's uh it's, you know there's a over glamour you know um and maybe some of the narratives that mckittrick talks about are erased right and so um those are two things that i, I live with and i write with and that i'm trying to um reconcile and um, this poem represents that. All right, so this poem is called uh, Nonviolent Public Relations. Uh, I remember when they were saying that Chicago was too violent. 
not just the violence was violent, but the stories too. And I think that's what folks always trying to do, wishing things appear, look better than things are. The subjects and stories then become detached from their humanity. A self gets in a hand, a hand directs the truth. And who ain't met a director that ain't on some type of ego trip that don't want the story to fit into their imagination? And ain't nobody want black bodies and blood to appear together like PB and J, T and honey, or C and salt, so satiable in their imagination. I imagine it hurts to say that Chicago is too violent, not because the violent ain't violent, but because the stories are too. I think that's why the great migration took faith, craving things appear, get better than things are. The spirit and stories then become attached to a body. A spirit gets in a mind, a mind finds truth. And who ain't found truth and went on some type of revisionary trip, ain't want their history to prelude freedom. But don't anybody want whole black bodies and faith to appear together like promises and land, milk and honey, or silver and gold, so nostalgic in our imaginations. Um, and so, yeah, so that, um, you know, I've th been thinking about a lot about like uh, alternative um, migrations, um, but also, uh, you know, dealing with, um, you know, sometimes the story can be like, uh, let's do some positive PR <laughs> for the city, you know, but, you know, without, um, you know, reconciling with these, these kind of colliding things that are happening, um, and that is joy and, um, uh, improvisation and you know um that is against uh some of the the um herbicide right so some of the the place annihilation that is happening through whether that's gentrification and things like that but i'm gonna stop rambling um but yeah that is um a work in progress um i really what resonate or what felt really um it had an effect on me i think i'm more of a calming effect it's like the the items that were mixed together like uh milk and honey um sea and salt like some of those things were that were mixed together i really like the is the cadence the right word like just the way that they sound together like really just had like almost a I want to say lullaby effect, but like when you say like so nostalgic in our imaginations, it had that feel to me, like the cadence of it had a sort of nostalgic feel. Yeah, that that piece gave me a feeling of like, and I've moved so much, so I can't really, I can't really speak to something specific, but this feeling of encountering a space that you know so well, like you've seen it your entire life, you're constantly encountering that space and then one day it's gone. And you're sharing the story of like, what was here, but what is there now is, is uh, just something completely different with a whole different kind of narrative wrapped around it that doesn't attest to what was there before this thing came about. And like, I'm thinking about it in terms of gentrification, I'm thinking about it like, um, just like even living here in the central district and like hearing these stories of like oh let's preserve the cd let's preserve the narratives of the central district like this is the one of the historic black owned places in business and having white people engage in those conversations but be a part of this ongoing gentrification project under this uh narrative of the central district is is diversifying and it's you know now it's a less violent place now that white people are partially here but they're participating in these conversations and is shifting the narrative it was very it kind of hits you and has you sit and kind of feel something like when you have those uh pairings together or um what was the one line it was like um about uh Pro approval or up to, no up here it was like uh craving to appear like i don't know something about that line just made me sit and just kind of like come back to like my i guess body and just like 
want to like be in that moment particularly and I can't explain that exactly other than just saying it was like kind of a call to just like be present and I don't again I don't know like where that's coming from but other than just your talent and and um and structure but oh yeah overall it was incredible thank you for sharing that with us thank you all for being nice <laughs> i appreciate it it's being real but it's just hey. being real. yeah it's just being honest i i appreciate how like we all had an effect um by your words regina yes thank you so i did a or i revisited a um painting i guess so it's, it's it's like a triptych of sorts and so there's this piece and there's this they're connected how's this connect i don't know it goes like here yeah so this one would go here and i don't have a third arm so i'm just gonna put this down <laughs> and then do this and so it goes something like this and so just imagine the other piece up there and so I was really connecting and playing with, I'll just hold this one up for now. I was really connecting and playing with um, what McKittrick is saying about like, if we um, look for alternative narratives, like what can be imagined and what can be lived. And so I've been doing a lot of thinking about like the black imagination and how, well, I wouldn't say the black imaginings, but black imaginations and how, um, through the imaginations, we can get to another, another world, another black world, uh, a way of living, another way of being, um, and relating to one another and to the world itself. Um, but I'm also really resonating with McKittrick, and as I've been saying before, how um, we still can't ignore how we presently live in a material reality that makes these these imaginations unlivable and so i'm kind of like reckoning with that paradox in this piece here and i'm thinking about um how can we at once see a black world but also don't have um okay i want to say this but also add an asterisk we don't have access but asterisk to the access to the assets to this black world. And the asterisk is saying that under our like certain ways of knowing the world and certain like traditional geographies and traditional or normative ways of understanding the world that is rooted in like white supremacist ways of understanding um, the world, we can't use those logics to understand the black, um, what black, the worlds that black imaginations are, um, are crafting, especially when they're speculative, especially when they're like wanting to not center the anti-Black violence. And so I wanted to portray this like inaccessibility with the um, like abstracted lines, like the lines that don't necessarily go in a linear fashion, but they're still like connected in a way. Um, which one is this? Is this one this? Wait, so like how the lines still line up across each um, panel, but they're still like separated and they're still like, they're not necessarily, um, they're not linear. They're not like, I, if I can think of this as a map, I couldn't necessarily follow it with like traditional geography or traditional ways of mapping or understanding maps. But, um, and I, I wanted to represent like the black imagination, um, at the center of the work and how like well if i think about the black imagination um at the center black imaginations at the center and there's like black lines that are running throughout the piece you can barely tell but they're separated by black lines and so i was thinking about like could this what would happen or how could we understand black imaginations in the world in which the imagination is creating if like if we could look at like the through lines or how it's going through certain, um, I guess, normative ways of understanding, or like I want to say white supremacist ways of understanding the world. Um, how can the black imaginations cut through that? And like what sort of ways of understanding the world do we need in order to get at like what is cutting through 
um, white supremacist geographies. Um, so that's like some of the things that I was working with. Um, as I, this is a piece that I've done um, before, but I revisited, I went back and like, and I had that in mind and had this like visual of, and so I guess like the process was really important to me, like the process of creating the black lines and like following, um, and, like keeping the, um, what I, what I'm wanting to understand about black imaginations and world building and you know following that through these lines and build and putting that into the lines and it's just some things that i've been thinking about but that's my piece um Brittany, can i ask the question yes i guess about your process did you have a plan i guess in mind for each of your sections so like as you were doing it you knew you wanted one to be because i think the top uh right one the that has more of the blue lines, it seems more kind of angular. And then the main one you were holding up, that's more of the pink lines, seems very mm -hmm. like where you have the linear element, but it's a lot more like fluid and you have different sh like shapes. Was that something you were keeping in mind as you were making each of them or did it just kind of come to you as you were doing it? No, well, as I was, um, so I drew it out first. And what I knew I wanted to do is like have all of the lines line up so that they're all connected um, with each other. Um, and the different, like as I was playing around with it, the difference of like the lines, it was a way to kind of like warp this idea of, I don't want to say traditional geography, I kind of want to just say like white geography or like um how like infrastructures think about geographies like i wanted to like warp them a little bit and i wanted to show like the different ways that they could be warped when thinking about like yeah white ways of knowing the world yeah i wanted to interrupt and warp them for some reason i thought of a lot about erosion mm. like 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 the literal like you know when it rains and like then there's like an eroding um but yeah but i was thinking about it like in a way like when i was looking at these pieces that were um uh can be together but not quite like you in the linear dominant like yeah so like yeah i was thinking but erosion like in as is a like a positive thing like a um like a form of resistance like erosion or i think about like maybe erosion is climate change is or like the earth's way of like shifting <laughs> like mm -hmm. geography is resistance but i don't know, that's what i was thinking about as i was holding up those pieces i was thinking about erosion i feel like art class stifled me stifle my creative abilities because the mantra is draw what you see, draw what you see. And that's the making of a great artist to be able to replicate exactly what you see to the point where just intuitively feeling through a piece and drawing from that space feels like an impossible task for me. And so I feel like what you just created, right? Like intuitively thinking through an, uh, something that you read, right? You're not drawing an image you're not regurgitating a portrait or anything you're intuitively feeling through this art practice and for me that feels like um that feels like the black imagination like that is an embodied artistic practice downloaded from whatever spirits are guiding you right to produce that work coming straight from you um and yeah i just really admire I just really admire people who can who can create from that space. That feels like a decolonized way of creating. So we can end our conversation with one last segment. And it's thinking about how can um, instructors, uh, so like we've all like instructed in some capacity and, um, like, so if other instructors were assigning a creative project, um, maybe assigning McKittrick words or any kind of like academic article, and they wanted to give a response, how could they offer 
feedback to students, especially when they're not, maybe they don't know how to grade poetry or maybe they don't know how to grade like visual arts, um, but how they could still like offer feedback if say it was in like a composition course or any kind of course. So what do you all like, do y'all have some like ideas that maybe um, instructors could think about when you know providing feedback for creative works? Well, something that I noticed that we all did was we shared our creative work and then we started to go into like the theories that are underpinning it or the re the sources that we're pulling from. So I think this additional writing component to maybe not explain our work, because I think there's something about the creative process that helps clarify for us the things that we are thinking through. And there's something about just the straightforward written component that helps people who may not understand the world. Like, I don't think I had to explain, I don't think any of us really had to explain what we were trying to do in our work amongst each other, because we kind of got it as like, we come from similar worlds. But I think that the additional writing out what I'm doing here specifically brings, you know, professors um, into, into just a, a, an understanding of what they may not be able to, unfortunately, through just witnessing the creative work and it letting it speak for itself. Mm -hmm. To continue from what um, Bobby shared, I think having that additional component, because that is something we all did, is kind of, again, not so much explain, but I think it's interesting that we all seem to kind of go different places with it. Like, um, I think Bobby gave us a bit of context about like the structure of um, like the official AA meetings to bring some more understanding to the uh, kind of underground meetings that they're describing. Or I think like Brittany, you're sharing more about your process and like how that was impactful. And I think we all kind of focused on something a little bit different in our explanation. So looking to that like what is the thing being described in your quick like kind of artists or creator statement like are you like what what you were focusing on like i think rashina you mentioned your structuring being really like primary so i think looking to that to like provide uh feedback or commentary like what is the thing that they're focusing on is it like maybe bringing more of the context behind your creative work into it and not so much critiquing the work itself as the expression of your understanding but like maybe trying to see what's uh what can maybe be communicated more like maybe more of the process or more of the uh background or context or something like that mm -hmm. yeah i can definitely see how like including a writing component would be like really helpful, especially as it's like um, thinking about citations and thinking how um, it can be really clear if an instructor is really want to see how a student is engaging with the material, um, seeing how they're pointing directly to the material. They say, for instance, if they were going to do McKittrick's work, they could ask for like, what are three quotes that are represented in your piece so that they're pulling directly to, from the material itself. And that can really help in that explanation too. Like, so a student could say something like, I'm really resonating with this line and they can explain that line and um, see how, show how they are representing it in this piece. I agree with what uh, everyone's saying, and I really like um, what you said, Kelly, um, about artist statement. Like, what if the written com component could be less like of a write a critical reflection, but you call it an artist statement, which is a critical reflection, right? Um, so, yeah, I really like that, and I think that that would be a wonderful pairing with some guidance, like you said, of, um, pulling from the material. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, I really love our remix of the seminar style classroom setting. Um, <laughs> 
And yeah, like I, I learned so much from y'all and I can't wait to like go back to revisit this article with some of what y'all were saying in mind. So I appreciate you. So yeah, thank you for taking the time with us. Thank you. I second that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so that concludes the episode. Um, I wish I had, we, we, should, we should get like one of those sound effects things. Um, so, you know, bing, 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 bing. Oh, I, I, got I got that. I got that. I should have been in my stew, my, my fake stew. Like, I, I would have been able <laughs> to hit it. Like, yeah, I have. Thank you for tuning in. We hope us sharing our artistry and conversation sparks your own conversations and ways you can incorporate creativity into your classroom and even in academic work. Please follow us on social media at The Chorus Speaks and online at thechorusspeaks.com. This program is funded by the Expository Writing Program at the University of Washington through their Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Collaboration Grant. It's also funded by the Black Opportunity Fund at the University of Washington. If you would like to sponsor or contribute to our work, please contact us on our webpage. Thanks for engaging. Talk to you next time. Thank you.